everybody welcome we are back for another thursday with summer of live at media vine i am here with amber brace girdle one of the co-hosts of the theory of content podcast amber can you say hi hi everyone yay we are so excited and we are working to get josh unseth in we have tried multiple browsers and we are struggling <laughs> we are on the struggle bus and it wouldn't be a facebook live if the struggle bus weren't present uh, so, so we'll just say that to start out with. And if Josh can't join us, Amber knows. Amber's Amber is saying that I'm drinking. This is water. Water. I said it, I said it should be vodka. Mm -hmm. No, we're not gonna. We're not gonna. That would gasoline we this don't, fire. We don't. Yeah, we don't know what's in my cup. So it's all. It could be anything. It could be so anything. we we are so excited to do this. We're gonna talk all things SEO today. We have a ton of questions already uh, in the pipe, and we are gonna take yeah. your questions live as well. We're so excited. I know we've got Julie and Courtney and Zona and Marie. We're so glad that you guys are here. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and kick off, and we're gonna keep our fingers crossed that we will have Joshua joining us <sighs> soon. Okay, Amber, let's start out with uh, Michelle's question. She had she had yes. many questions. We love Michelle. Uh, Michelle said, "How do I appropriately remove no longer related content so Google sees me as appropriately niche? Meaning, what steps do I take for the posts that just need to go away altogether, and also for the posts <laughs> like the one where my daughter used to wear underwear on her head that I want to keep <laughs> for me, but not right. something she necessarily wants to be searched or indexed." by right well so here's the deal um for some reason there's this idea out there that that google niches you or they care like they want you to remove content that's not relative to your niche but the thing is you're not like a um e-commerce site you're not a you're not the same as all recipes like you are a blogger and those lifestyle content posts are fine to have. There's really no such thing as crawl budget when it comes to um, a blogger. You just don't have enough content. I know that there was a podcast out there that said, you know, I deleted a third of my content and my SEO rose, but they don't talk about the fact that the site they use or when it's talked about in other places, the, the it's not put in context of the site they used for that example was an e-commerce site with thousands and thousands of irrelevant or discontinued items, right? Which that's important to Google, right? Because if somebody looks for something and they're constantly getting hits on a discontinued item, that's not valuable to the end user, right? Um, there really is no reason to remove this old content at all. Like, I'm just going to put it out there. There's no reason to remove it. It may drive you crazy, but just even if there are underwear there. on the head, that's what you're even saying. If, in fact, that makes your site like more personable. Like I don't, I would never delete stuff like that. Like you're keeping it for yourself because your blog is for you first and foremost. Right. And SEO shouldn't get in the way of that ever. Um, and so I, my answer is don't delete it. Like, I realize that's not the answer you're looking for. Um, if there is a situation where you absolutely want a post gone from your site, first of all, the thing to remember is that it's never really gone on the internet. Like there's things like the Wayback Machine that will still have a copy of some of this stuff. So you have to kind of internalize that and accept that, that there's nothing ever gone on the internet. But then the next thing to do is to make sure that there are no... Um, that there are no links coming into that site. Um, if you can't really figure that out, basically just unpublish the post and watch your analytics to see if there are um, lots of 404s coming from it. And if there are, then you can redirect that URL to, um, to something else that's more relevant um, would be the way that I would do that. I wouldn't actually delete it from WordPress though. I would just unpublish it. So the answer is don't. Don't essentially. Which is Michelle what I, seems to love. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Oh, Sherry, I'm so jealous you're at the beach. I know. I'm upset too. It's 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 not cool. It, and Josh is still struggling. He's saying he can't load from his phone. So that's happening too. Um so Michelle also wants to understand the level of differentiation between the old content and the new content. She says niching isn't really a thing. Yeah, it's not. I mean, there are plenty. Of, <laughs> there, You're there right. Are plenty, there are plenty of bloggers that are successful, and they have travel, and they have 
recipes and, you know, they have all of this lifestyle stuff. Google sees you as lifestyle. You don't have to be food. You don't have to be travel. Like, yes, there are some people that have more success if they are niche down. Like, you know, Pinch of Nom is a great example of this. They're, they're a site within Mediavine that um, blogs about a, a British diet called Slimming World. Um, and I think the reason they're so successful is that there's just simply a ton of search around those topics anyway, and they sort of provide all of the information that's being asked for, right? So that that's why they're successful with SEO, but there's no reason that they couldn't also be successful with travel if they put it on their site, et cetera. You know what I mean? It's about answering the questions that people are asking Google. That's literally what this is. Um, so yeah, I, that's kind of my opinion on that subject. I think, <laughs> poor Josh. I know this Sorry. is terrible. So on, on that vein, Amber, so you're saying yes. asking the questions that are, that Google is asking. So we've got a question from Andy McClung. He says, do you recommend using tools like SEMrush or SpyFu for keywords? He says, I have good rankings now, but is it needed to break into the next level of traffic content? So how do we find out the questions that Google is asking? Well, so I don't think it's necessary until you reach a level where you've completely exhausted Google Search Console, okay? Um, Google Search Console is free. It shows you what you're ranking for. And we talked about this a little bit at the EFC podcast that we did live. Um, but basically what you should do is you should go into Search Console and you, could, you, so you can sort the information that's there by... Um, number of clicks and um, how you are uh, ranking. And you don't even want to look at the stuff that you're ranking top three for. You want to um, look at the stuff where you're ranking like four through 10 or maybe four through 12. And for each of those topics, you then want to create at least three more pieces of content around that subject right? You, that literally is a year's worth of content right there. If you just go into it and get, you know, 15 topics that you need to write three more pieces about. Um, and so you can, you can do this a number of ways to decide. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. look who it is. Yeah. Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. Huzzah. Okay. We've done no uh, We heard you for a second and then you went quiet. Yeah, we heard you for a moment. Now I hear you. It sounds like you're far, far away in a galaxy. Yeah, it sounds like the mic in front of you is not on, but another mic is. Thank you, everyone, for being patient. Amber, keep yeah. answering. Josh, just make like a low-level humming sound, and then when I hear you, <laughs> I'll do a thumbs up. This mic isn't working. Yeah, there's a little bit of sound. Okay. Oh. Can we disconnect the uh, lapel? Oh, there you are. There you are. Guys, this is a tech company. That's what's scary about all of this. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Josh. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Glad, glad to be here. We're so glad that you were. we made it. It was a little bit of a struggle, but we got here and we're excited about it all. All right. So... So Amber, continue on that yes. story about SEMrush. So we're, we're, you were talking right. about to refresh. What we're asking is how do you find out what questions Google are asking? We'll have Josh weigh in in a moment. We're having people asking about the value of SEMrush or SpyFu or other of those keyword research or finding tools. Right. And so what I was saying is that they should start with Google Search Console. And I've sort of reiterated what you said at EFC about creating at least three pieces of content for all of these things that you're ranking for, like four through 10, four through 12, um, that you want to bring up in ranking. Um, and we were talking, I was in my head thinking about the fact that Alarm Grid has sort of exhausted at this point what Google Search Console has to offer. And so now you rely on like SEMrush for a lot of this stuff, right? No, Josh, again. No, I can't hear you, babe. Oh, God. Oh, okay. I'm almost. You sound like you're in a hallway, but we yeah. hear you. Okay. Let me, let me talk through the hallway for now. I'll talk a little louder. It's on a mic that's like on the other side of the room. So I'll do this. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> So Alarm Grid, it, it has, you're right, Webmaster Tools, there's a lot of keywords in it, and we are, um, we've, we're, it's not giving me 
uh, tons and tons more keywords that we can like, you know, rank for. So I do use SpyFu. Generally, SpyFu is going to go, uh, give me uh, results for things that are, um, you know, PPC related generally. And uh, SEM Rush, which has broader search terms for um, uh, a lot of it. Like it's not as specific. They're not exact match keywords. Whereas Webmaster Tool is giving you exact match, which I've always liked. But most people aren't going to need to move into those other tools because most of you have hundreds, if not thousands of keywords uh, that you can use in Webmaster Tools. And not just that, Webmaster Tools gives you sort of, uh, they give you smaller resolution. So you can, you can look day to day. So Alarm Grid actually ranks a little bit differently for keywords because they're searched differently on weekends as opposed to weekdays. So I actually pull <laughs> our, week, our weekend keywords, um, which are the keywords that uh, generally are searched for by probably users rather than installers. Um, and I use those so that we can actually target keywords that are going to uh, be more consumer specific. So you can look at little tricks like that, but it's really in how you use the tools. The tools themselves are just, I mean, it's like you can you can buy a, 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 an SEM. It's Rush. Josh's Slack. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> you can buy your SEM. Slack friend. You can buy an SEM Rush membership, but you know if you don't really know how to use it, uh, you're basically just carrying around a hammer and uh, with no nails. And uh, maybe maybe you don't know how to use the hammer. You just pick it up and, and, and throw it. At the I ball. mean, I can come up with uses for a hammer without nails, Josh. Like... Uh, I'm sure, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you could. I I would just kind of look at it and uh, I don't know, uh, maybe maybe drop it or something on your foot. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to plunge into something that is very controversial. The the one keyword tool researcher that you were saying is it SEMrush or SEMrush? We're going to need to. Let's get the definitive answer no, here. Well, it's, we go back and forth. You cut what the name is? Show, how you is it? How you pronounce? Is it SEM Rush or SEM Rush? Oh, I I I say SEM Rush. Uh, oh, I left the baby monitor. Sorry, on. I say yeah. SEM Rush when I refer to it, but like a lot of people. Say and now he's gone completely. Cool. We're just struggling. We're really really struggling. Is this better? And Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Hey. Finally. Back, okay. Back off it a little. A okay. little. There, there we go. Okay. Hey. Right. Oh, okay. There's that me. that's done. Wonderful. There we okay. go. SEM Rush stands for search engine marketing. Generally, search engine marketing in the industry refers to like PPC, so pay per click, where people are purchasing keywords. So these tools usually are are meant to be uh, paid keyword tools. Webmaster Tools is like by Google's a little different because it's actually made for webmasters, um, particularly webmasters uh, doing content. So you're going to be getting content that is maybe blog related. It's it's a little bit more blog specific. So I I always recommend that people focus on uh, Google Webmaster Tools until they have uh, exhausted Google and Google Webmaster Tools, which very few people do. And, uh, and in fact, I still haven't. I'm just like, it's, it's less useful for me than it was uh, three years ago. But uh, until you've exhausted Google Webmaster Tools, and then you can kind of move into these other tools, which are actually more catered to PPC and paid keyword specific uh, type searches. So Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So let's go ahead and do a quick, a quick pause in all of the great content that we're sharing. And let's, let's introduce ourselves briefly. I've got Amber and Josh since now that we're all together and talk to me a little bit about the theory of content. So first introduce yourselves. Sure. I'm Joshua Unseth and I am a, I, I guess I, I it's, I, uh, I own the company or, or one of the owners of the company. So I work at Alarm Grid. Um, I call myself the director of marketing, but I, I, you know, I could, I could take any title I want. Like I suppose I could be the pilot of Alarm Grid, but, uh, but I'm the director. I'll call myself the director of marketing for the purpose of this. Um, and uh, I, I basically do direct our marketing efforts here. So um, particularly with regard to search and uh, that's really what we focus on actually is search and search marketing. Cool. Amber Bracegirdle just, just left the frame. She's back. Sorry, I'm back. I was just turning <laughs> on a light. I felt like that might be a good idea. Um, my name is Amber Bracegirdle, and I'm one of the co-founders of um, Mediavine. And yeah, I started doing SEO stuff when I started working with the guys on Food Fanatic, our food site. And one of these days, about probably a year ago, uh, Josh was like, Hey, I want to do a podcast, but I tried to do it by myself and it was terrible. It was awful. <laughs> oh, okay. It was so boring. <laughs> he, was, 
<laughs> he was like, will you come, will you come on the show? Like, will you come do a show with me? And I was like, yeah, sure. And theory of content was born. Yeah. And, and, um, uh, and it basically, sorry, yeah, Amber, ahead, I, I was running over this. This, this is a you perpetual like problem for us. Cool. I do. I mean, our focus really is we we love we I love content. That's my my mm-hmm. love. And Amber has a similar passion. And in fact, I think mm-hmm. most of the people at Mediavine have a pretty similar passion for content. So um, content is a weird thing. It's this like amorphous entity. It's art. But uh, and and you get to create it however you want. So you can be out there. You know, it's with the Internet. There's there's no barriers to entry. So you can put right. stupid content out. You can put good content out. You can put bad content out. It doesn't really matter. You get to try and it's free. So what I really wanted to do uh, with Amber was basically put a show together that uh, talked about the problems that people encounter creating content, how to yeah. think about content, um, and how to create content that you're proud of. I don't really care if it's good content or bad content. I want I, I want to help people create content that they're proud of um, and that's unique. Yeah, and for me, the aspect of helping our publishers was huge, right? Like they'd been asking for uh, SEO advice and we didn't have sort of a grand scale way to help each person. And this was an easy way to do that, to give them access to people who are knowledgeable in it, who've grown sites using these techniques and have proof positive that they work um, and sort of debunk stuff that comes out and takes groups by storm and that kind right. of thing is huge right. for me. Incidentally, yeah. like, I don't think that we meant to make it uh, an SEO podcast and I don't, I, I, I don't oh. really want it to be. Um, and I, I, so like we, we do some SEO cause like, I, I think that we have a lot of SEO knowledge. So it's very difficult not to end up in the realm of SEO. Um, mm-hmm. But I think for the most part, like, like my goal is to just talk about the process of creating content and on online, incidentally, that means that you talk a lot about search engine optimization, or you talk about pay-per-click depending on what industry you're in. But um, the, the theory of content really, I mean, we named it that because it literally is supposed to be uh, about the theory of creating content. My theory, Amber's theory, everyone's kind of got an approach to content. So what is your approach? to content how do you how do you make continue to make it better how do you continue to attract eyeballs how do you make the people that are already reading it continually happy i mean i don't think that i think though that it's interesting that you did it and it's it's become identified as an seo podcast and i think that's because any blogger which we deal with at mediavine quite frequently is having uh seos is just that word that everyone says it all the time everywhere you are and it's just a random like it's it's taken on like voldemort mythic proportions of seo but you got i gotta work on my seo and it's very it feels like a very overwhelming thing that i think that you guys have managed to break into these chunks that people can actually do something as opposed to just wandering around constantly feeling like your seo or your five pounds too heavy is not good enough like i feel like kind of a thing. I think that's true. And I think, I think the thing with SEO is that people view it as a barrier to creating content. They get very afraid of how to make content. They get very afraid of writing because they're not, they're not writing perfectly. They're not writing, um, you know, the way that Google wants them to, or the way that, you know, they themselves, the standards that they've set for themselves. So, I mean, the, the reason that we end up delving a lot into SEO is because we want to remove the barrier to, to doing that content. And right now that's kind of the big barrier. So if we can demystify that, make SEO not magical and, and help people realize that they can do it uh, just by that it's incidental to the content that they can, that they are doing SEO just by writing and that what the majority of SEO is, is just creating more content. Um, that is the goal of Google, creating more, creating better. Um, that is the goal of Google is to get people to get more relevant content up. Um, if, if that is what people take away, that is absolutely, I think, the most valuable thing that we could do for bloggers. So more is better in terms of content. It's more is more is more. Well, yes. quali- quality is better. Quality more. Well, wow. and it's it, like I think that you can have a ten thousand piece uh, blog post that's just crap, and uh, and I, I would say that's a crappy blog post. But um, if you write, you know, five hundred words and they're they're really informative, really useful, wonderful words that you've now added to the library of human knowledge, like that's that's great content, and more of that is better always. So, guys, I want you to as you're writing 
really just think about the library of human content. And, and I want you to just pat yourself on the back continuously for the amazing work that you're doing in the library of human content. So I'm going to bounce back to uh, Search Console. Nicole wants to know, and this is another thing I think we all get wrapped up in it. It's easy. The rankings. So she's saying, yeah. if you're already in spot two or three, do you take if it ain't broke, don't fix it approach? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, you, you can't really, you can't really do much. I mean, like Google is, uh, you know, she's fickle. a fickle woman and, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's very difficult. I mean, like you can't, you can't command Google to rank you number one. You can do everything that you can to rank there. And, uh, and, and one of the approaches that SEOs will make in terms of marketing themselves is they'll guarantee you number one positions. And, just to give you the trick so you can now understand what they're promising is that what they do is they run, you know, a hundred thousand keywords. They find out which of the similar keywords you're ranking for, and then they'll tell you that they got you ranked for it. Um, it's an, it's an old trick and it doesn't matter. Like you, if you're number one, two, three, those are spots that are all really good. Number one is clearly the best, but you can't force Google to rank you there. Right. I mean, and also that's really dependent on like the person's search history as well. So like, you know, we talk about this a lot with our food fanatic contributors. Like if someone has been on food fanatic before, it's likely that they will see the food fanatic results as number one or number two and the blogger as number three. Whereas if they've been on the blogger site before or related blogger sites, they might see the blogger first unless they're searching incognito. Right. And stressing about those positions over and over and over again is just a waste of your energy. Right. And, and to that end, I mean, I think I think the message is stress about making good content. So, like, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, if you if you're wondering, like, should you do a lot of work to increase your rankings? Um, the answer is only yes, if it means that you're going to do a lot of content creation as in, in order to bolster your rankings. Um, and I think I think the best we, we talk all the time about the parboiled potatoes. Uh, example that Amber gives, um, where yeah. they wanted to rank with another one. Really, well, it's, it's a really good one though. You wanted to rank better for parboiled yeah. uh, potatoes. And so what? And what you what you did is you ended up ranking for parboil everything because the content that you built to support the parboiled potatoes post um, added to the library of human uh, of the human whatever I said, <laughs> the, library, the library of human content. Um, no, but you, you added to the library of human content. You really did. Cause like you, you made five, six, seven posts that were mm -hmm. unique and new and actually were, uh, were helpful to people looking for those other things all in support of the potato. Yep. The humble potato has never uh -huh. had it so good. The humble poisonous potato. It's a nightshade. It is a nightshade like the eggplant. Things I learned writing that stuff. <laughs> uh, we've got some questions from Sherry. So yeah. Sherry wants to know if you're starting a new site and don't have the content for Search Console to give you the results about, would you start with a paid keyword tool? Um, okay, so if you're starting a new site and you don't have the content, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean that that's so keywords keywords come in different shades i guess and uh and to understand nightshades the, the nightshades and to understand the landscape of keywords uh it's pretty good i think to, to kind of understand how paid keyword research works so paid keyword research splits keywords into three types you have exact match mm -hmm. you have phrase match and you have broad match um uh, the, the, what you really need to worry about, well, the, the, real simply, you basically have two two categories that are broader. So, like it's uh, related words, um, you know, keywords that are sort of not the exact keyword. And then, if you can find a tool that gives you the exact match keywords, such as like uh, Google's uh, AdWords uh, Key Planner. What is it? The, the key keyword planner. Keyword planner. They, keyword, I don't know. They kind key of key planner word they tool. They keep changing it. <laughs> they keep changing it. The planning tool yeah. that Google gives you, they give you they give you some exact match results um, and you can compare those. But basically, the broad matches are going to give you the entire ecosystem of keywords that are about that topic. And the keyword, the exact match keyword is going to tell you exactly how many people are actually searching those words specifically. Um, that's the potential search volume if you're ranking number one for that exact 
exact specific keyword. Yeah. So a PPC tool is actually pretty good because it's going to generally give you broader matched keywords and uh, and that will allow you to start creating content that's going to drill down uh, to that sort of important keyword. And what's going to happen in Webmaster Tools is as people search and as you start ranking for those things, you're going to start ranking for the most important keyword in that set, um, very likely, particularly if you have a, uh, a, powerful, a powerful blog. Um, and uh, you'll you'll start seeing that creep up. But in the meantime, you're going to be capturing all the rankings that for the keywords that sort of surround that main topic. And, uh, and, and you'll be able to become, you know, sort of this niche expert that people dream of becoming. It's authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to answer your question, Sherry, about whether you'd update existing content or write new complementary, uh, you can, it's sort of a, a both. Um, make sure the existing content is is good, and and then you definitely you want to be writing new complementary content. And again, this is something that we we talk about a lot on the podcast. Of you don't have to necessarily push that content out to your loyal audience if you're worried about people who, you know, subscribe to your RSS feed or your newsletter being bombarded about the ten rest, you know, the ten new posts you wrote about blueberry muffins. You can <laughs> sort of <laughs> you can sort of um, Josh hates when I say this, but you, the easiest way is to just backdate it. So it doesn't go out in your RSS feed or on your homepage, um, and make sure that, you know, you're, you're basically, you're, you're putting more content about that subject out. And an important piece of this is also making sure that all of this content links around to each other. So with like the parboil post, as we wrote each one, we updated everything that had been published so far with links to the newest post as well as all the other posts in the series and we updated the original post with links to all of the new content so you need to make sure that it's all interlinking to each other that's an extremely important important part of this that i got yelled at by yeah. for, <laughs> and i i for forgetting I, I to don't do that, by the way amber like i just think it's <laughs> not the best option um yeah but it is the easiest. It is, and and if that's again, if that's your if if that's your barrier, just do it. Like that's fine. Yeah. It's not going to kill anything. I just I just favor I just favor being honest to Google over uh, over lying to Google about things like dates. So like I, I try, I, you know, just because like Google likes honest content, uh, you know, yeah. but like it's not a big deal. That's not going to be the deciding factor. Um, Google will still rank you, and it'll show that as the creation date. So you know, it's yeah it's, it's not, it's not a bad option. Yeah. And Nicole, you've got it exactly right. Nicole, Nicole Bur Burkholder's statement about where she should focus and all of that. You've got it exactly right. That's exactly what you should do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to jump because we just started talking about linking a link strategy mm -hmm. and we've got a question on what is the best internal and external linking strategy? That's a great question. Um, Okay, so we talked earlier about those keywords and, uh, and and doing the keyword research and sort of the big keywords you're going after. Um, you want to you want to rank on descriptive keywords, very simply. So, like, if you're linking to a blog post uh, on your own site about uh, I don't know mashed cauliflower, you probably want to link on the words mashed cauliflower or mashed cauliflower recipe. Is that a is that a thing? Is mashed cauliflower a thing, Amber? Mm -hmm. It is. Good, All right. Good job. <laughs> I feel like sometimes I feel like words are like I, I pick a noun and then pick a, a food. <laughs> yeah, um, only if it's a parboil. <laughs> like a verb. Yeah. Is the cauliflower parboiled? That's the question. Yeah. yeah. Frozen. You know, sometimes something. he makes up he makes up food and I'm like, no, rewind. <laughs> we gotta edit that out. That's Gooseberry not. pate. What? Yeah. I don't know. That's yeah, I don't not, I don't know what a pate thing, is, dude. but I, I could do it. So um, but maybe you want to rank for gooseberry pate. Um, so you'd want to link on the keyword gooseberry pate and or gooseberry pate recipe, depending on what it is. And uh, and the other thing is people people are overly concerned with with uh, linking. Um, thing, here's the thing. When I was when when I was a baby, uh, links were really, <laughs> really important. I remember that, uh, p you know, clients would want to rank for something like vacuum cleaner. So you'd, you'd call up the New York Times, you'd bribe an author, and then they would uh, they would give you a link to, to vacuum cleaner. And now you would rank number one for vacuum cleaner. And it was just like that one link. That was it. You were done. You, you could you could go home. You could mm -hmm. sleep. 
and uh, and you'd sell vacuum cleaners or you know have people click on your vacuum cleaner based Google AdWords, um, and it would just be you'd, you'd be rich, you'd be retired today. So, you know, we all regret not not doing that. Um, but then most of us didn't have the money to bribe the New York Times author. No, that didn't actually. That, that, you didn't need to bribe anyone. They, I definitely, <laughs> yeah, I definitely just. So I had a connection to Huffington Post. A uh -huh. very good friend of mine was was Ariana Huffington's uh, managing editor when they first started. And so they gave Food Fanatic a, a contributor account, and I very much regret not posting there more often than we did. Yeah, but but you have to realize that like yeah. links links have been over the years degraded as mm -hmm. a linking signal. So like yeah. or a ranking signal, it's it's important. It always will be. Um, links are a very simple way to you know gain authority and tell Google that someone important likes you. Um, mm -hmm. But they're not. They're no longer like if you get a, a link from the New York Times, um, it's no longer going to make or break your site. It's yeah. a lot of other things you can do, and all of the things that we talk about. So, so I think people spend a, a little bit too much time, and I think it's a legacy, uh, a legacy right. mentality that says that like linking is the most important thing you should spend your time on. So, right. Uh, yeah, so it's so a link on strong keywords. That's a good strategy. And, and in terms of, ex yeah, descriptive keywords. And in, yes. in terms of external linking, um, you know, we do this on Food Fanatic, and I think it's important to be a good net citizen. Google yeah. wants you to do that. So link out to content that is helpful for your readers. Yeah. You know, if you've got a friend that's written a post, Google doesn't know they're your friend. So it's okay. Don't worry. Um, link out, link <laughs> out to them. You know, I get questions about that all the time. Will they know that I'm, well, unless you're linking yet. to them in every single post. They don't know yet. Right. Unless you're linking to them in every single post, then no, they're not going to, like, they're not going to be like, that's your friend. You're, you have a link scheme. Right. That's not how that works. Um, so yes. And yes, Allie, it's, it's okay to link to other people's similar posts. Um, because those or those are, um, helpful to your readers. You know, like if you've got a post about different types of sugar and someone else has a post about different types of flour, that might be helpful to talk about in that post and say, you know, if you're baking and you need to know about the different types of flour too, here, go to my friend Sarah's post. You know what I mean? There's, but there's link on daisies, different yeah. lilies, <laughs> flowers, Joshua. Okay. Two things. One, marigolds. one gooseberry pate is a thing. Did you Google and, it? And I did not, but I just had a colleague who was monitoring questions. It is a thing and it is sold on the market. We can provide I links. Man. I, I dare someone to, wow. to, 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 to rank for that. I'll give them a Bitcoin. No, I won't. I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, that's a thing. So the Bitcoin world, guys. Um, but, no, okay, so so here's here's the thing. Like, Yeah, real simple. Also, it needs to be mentioned. If, if someone else is talking about you, um, I, I, I am a fan of being opportunistic when it comes to, uh, to links. I, I think that if someone talks about you, then that's an appropriate time to go email them and say, Hey, would you mind linking to this page? That would be great. But other than that, I, I, I honestly, like, I know companies that hire entire groups of people who pick up the phone and try to basically sell people on, on, on linking to them. And, and I don't think that that's a really good strategy for long-term growth. I think that that's mostly wasted effort. So only, I, I tend to, to say when people link or have the, when you think that there's a blog that you have an opportunity to get a link in, be opportunistic, email them, be nice, um, and then, and then leave it. And if they don't link mm -hmm. to you, they don't link to you. And if they do, oh, it's yeah. great. So Nicole is saying, though, but would you link externally to a similar recipe or idea? Aren't you competing against yourself? You're competing against other blogs for rankings. I think that that's a fair point. Um, but I mean, I, why, why are you linking to a similar uh, a similar recipe? I mean, like if, if you have all the information in your recipe, uh, you don't necessarily need to link to a similar recipe. The the thing is, like, if someone did some content that inspired you or is additional supplemental content to your post, that's the kind mm -hmm. of thing that you might want to link to. Um, if if it's the same recipe, or let's say they maybe let, they let's say in their recipe they have a Q and A that you like, um, it might be time for you to kind of not steal content, but incorporate that sort of content into your own post. You 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 look at what they have that you don't have, and you don't take it word for word. You don't even 
like look at them and uh, and and write sentence by sentence or similar sentences. You look at the question that they're answering, and then you answer it in your own way. And uh, and now you now now you don't have the need to to link out to somebody in an instance where they're like you know building content that's the same as yours. Um, but you want your content to be better than your competitors in search, which means that it's something that you need to do to incorporate um, content okay. that someone else creates. You need to incorporate the, that sort of content. You do it in your own words. You do it in your own style. And then to make make your content more valuable than theirs. That That's how you compete. Right. I, I mean, I, so I know, I know for a fact that there's a lot of this discussion happening in Facebook groups right now that it's not nice to go after each other's keywords and things yeah. like that. But the thing is, you're content creators, you're in the same niche. This is a, this isn't like, it's business, it's a competition, but it's not about taking down another person's site. It's about creating the best content. You have no control over what, who or how Google ranks someone. They are going to rank the person with the best content. So if you suddenly get outranked by someone, it's not because they did something or caused you to be downgraded. It's because they wrote better content. According to Google. Right? And yes, according to yeah. Google. And so improve your content and you'll get your ranking back would be and, my thought. And I think it's important it's important to say this like first of all you're not owed those positions and mm -hmm. uh, if your entire site is built on the backs of a keyword that you get a million hits off every month you're screwed. You're done. Because <laughs> yeah. like like all your it, eggs are in that basket. Right. And and all I have to do is, you know, let's say I find out about that keyword and I start ranking for it, I'm going to take your users. And, uh, and, and a million keywords, that's, that's a lot of users, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm going to find those keywords. I'm going to take them. Your keywords that have more search, they are going to have more competition. That's just the way it is. So count your blessings when you're ranking for a keyword that has a lot of search. And, and then use the opportunity to take that money and devote it to spending your Creating time more making more content. Because that's just, that's the, you have, it's an index. Like when you put your money in right. the stock market, you have a lot of risk if you put it all into one stock. But if you put your money into right. lots of different stocks, you spread out the risk. It's the same thing with And keywords. I mean, I, I find this so interesting because like Josh, Josh doesn't have any, like there are only certain alarm model numbers, right? Right. Only certain ones. There's, there's, there's not like, it's a competition and it's understood that it's a competition and it's the same with recipes and it's the same with craft. It's the same guys. Like literally your post is an alarm model number. And you just yeah. need to treat it like that. I understand that food and craft and travel is so passionate because it is your, it is your joy in life and you're doing the thing that you love. But at the end of the day, the content you've created, as far as Google is concerned, is just an item number that they're trying to provide the best content about for the person who's searching for that item number, right? So just right. And create the best possible content you can. And one of the things Go you ahead. can do is like if you have people creating content that you like, like your friends, um, and they they make a post, and you know what, you you realize that their content is missing something. It, it it's not a bad thing to say like, hey, I was really inspired by this piece that such and such did. I wanted to add some. I, I wanted to add some uh, text and let them know that you know like like answer a question that like I ran into while making their recipe or something like that. So there's supplemental content and you're not necessarily going to rank them for the main keyword but you might rank for like if you had a question while baking a recipe, someone else might have that question and you're going to build content that allows you to uh, you know build off of other people's content. Content is iterative, which means basically that you have like you have a piece of paper and you know you start writing and then the next sentence follows from the previous. And that's the same thing. Like if someone makes content that inspires you, you're going to make a, you're going to make content that is inspired and and follows from their content. Um, and it's going to end up competing in some of the same keyword spaces. That's not mean. That's flattering. And that's uh, that's something that you should be doing for each other. You should, if someone outranks you, high five them um, and say, next year, next year, I'm going to beat you. And then, and then yeah. work your butt off to do it. But then don't focus just on that keyword. Build content right. for other keywords. 
Right. I mean, I remember I had um, I had this exact experience with Mary Youngkin, who's one of our bloggers. She wrote about um, Rudy's Cream Corn, which is something that my personal site has ranked like in the top three, four since 2008 when I first published it. But I have not updated my blog in two years. So she wrote about it. And then she suddenly realized that she was right behind me in rankings. And I was like, that is so awesome. And yep. she was like, what do you mean that's awesome? I'm taking that traffic from you potentially. Like, what if I start to outrank you? And I was like, you're providing the better content because you're still blogging. Like, that's what Google's going to do. They're going to provide the best content. And if someone else has written about it three years after I have, and I haven't touched my post in four years, that's the better content. That is just, that's how it is. So like we have to sort of separate our feelings from it. Right. Um, I saw that Michelle Price asked a question about interlinking um, about, do I need to go back to the old posts linked from and link to them too, or just when I update those posts in general Um, in terms of like interlinking, I personally think it's best to always do that at the same time. Like when you write a new post where you're linking to an old post, if there's an opportunity to link from the old post to the new post, do it at the same time, just to make sure that you're covering both ends of that so that they, Google understands as they index that those are related and, and you're saying, you know, I'm an expert in this topic and here's, they're linking to each other because it's the same stuff. Right. So one of yeah. one of the things that I like to do is I like to use my old coast coast. I having a strong uh, the, I, the old post old posts uh, uh, as as a uh, as as a repository for links. So for we example, can't help you. You're in Florida. You got Someone the number. Call help. <laughs> Um, no, if you, if you, if you want, you, what you can do is you can look, you can look through your old posts. So if you find a keyword that you really want to rank for, um, and you have a lot of old posts that talk about, you know, things that are tangentially related, you can actually search your site for the times you've used that keyword and decide if those, uh, if those times might be appropriate to then update to like the new post. Um, and for me, you know, we're writing about all this alarm equipment. So let's say, you know, I need to rank for Honeywell alarm systems. I have tons and tons of old posts where we haven't linked to the page that I'm trying to get ranked for the Honeywell alarm system that talk about Honeywell alarm systems. And that, that, that content that we now have on Honeywell alarm systems is supplementary to all that old stuff. So that's, I, I'm, I'm able to use those old posts basically as like a repository for links. Um, okay, guys. So we've got a question here. It is from uh, we've got a lot of questions. We have a lot we of should questions. Say, <laughs> so we should say if we don't, because we only have like 13 more minutes. If we don't get to everything, Josh and I will take whatever questions are on the live and we'll cover them in another theory of content episode. So yeah. I want to really quickly, this is, um, it's actually my sister-in-law, and she has a question. <laughs> my niece is watching. Hello, Jack. Nepotism. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, but she wants to know if adding tags to your posts is a good way to add keywords to your post, or is this a beginner's mistake? So I think the tags thing is a big question. And what is it actually useful? Is it doing anything? Yeah, tags yeah. and categories. and Tags don't matter that much. Period. He's done. No. Here's, here's what here's what happens. So tags tags like out a WordPress post. Uh, what they do is they the, the best thing they do is they create a page. Um, the tags and categories are they're not that different. Um, you know they but it, a tag creates a new page and that page might rank for things and might you know users might find it helpful. Yeah. Um, you can. There, I know there's another question about cornerstone content. You can turn that tag page into cornerstone content. Right. Which we can talk through. And there's, you know, there's like, there's a lot of uses for tags. Uh, like, for example, if uh, you have all sorts of gooseberry pâtés, maybe there's more than one kind, <laughs> uh, and you really like making them, uh, maybe you make 10 gooseberry pâtés, and maybe maybe it's a well-searched term, gooseberry pâté recipes, or, multi, you know, what what's the best gooseberry pâté? And you could turn those tag categories, tag, there's a Minnesota in me, you could Take. turn those tag, tag ca categories uh, into those sort of, uh, you know, larger uh, subject based pages, which which is a great way to do it. But I, I would say on page, I don't think Google's really using tags as a strong indicator for how to rank uh, any page more than it is text. And, and the text is less relevant because it's surrounded by tags, not by other good text. 
Okay, we've got some people here. We're, we're getting so many questions that we're not going to get to them all. And I want, I've got two more things that I definitely want to segue to before we end. But we've got people saying, yes, talk about turning tag pages into cornerstone content. We've got people talking about uh, if you're adding more pieces of content for your top ranking keywords, do you use the same keywords? But before we go far away, I want mm -hmm. to for sure address redirects. And, yeah. and how those work. And then I also want to have here, get both of you guys best strategy. If you're going to spend 30 minutes to an hour a day on improving the SEO on your site, what are those actionable items that we can send people to go away with? So let's, let's talk about redirects quickly and why the 301 is for versus the, like how to do it and what just so address redirects. Sure. Cool. So there are two kinds of redirects that you should care about. There's a 301 and the 302. Uh, and the only one that you really need to care about usually is a 301. So a 301 redirect is a permanent redirect. It says to Google when the, when, the, when the search engine comes to the page, it says, oh, this page isn't here anymore. It has forever moved to this other place. This is its new home. Uh, it's, it's like the post office uh, forwarding mail address in some ways. Um, and what that does is Google takes all of the links that you have to that page and it redirects that equity to the new page. It says, this is the new page. All of the links are credited here instead of here. That's really a 301's only, uh, only thing. A 302 is a temporary redirect. Let's say you're, I don't know, doing maintenance or I don't know, something on your site. Generally, you don't need to worry about them, but that's a temporary redirect. There are strange little uses for them, but the 301 is really what you got to worry about. Um, and then there's other codes like a 404 page is what happens if you remove content from your site. Um, but the 301 redirect, you just basically what you're doing is you're telling Google that stuff is permanently moved. And that's what you're going to need to do if you have like, uh, if you rebrand, if you maybe change the URL structure on your site, um, you know, and a number of other things. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not like 301s are, are, are pretty simple. Uh, I try to try to recommend that people don't use them if they can. So like if you screw up the URL on your, on, on your content, it's not the end of the world. Just keep it the screwed up URL. Um, it's not a strong ranking metric by any means. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, we've definitely, Eric has very strong opinions about this, right? <laughs> we, we, we know that like, is I think for technical uh, reasons more than his is, yeah, his is for technical reasons. So a lot of times you'll see me beg someone not to take dates out of their URLs. Um, and the reason for that is that, um, Site-wide redirects at a host level can really slow down your site depending on your host. And if you don't have a host that like is definitely paying attention to site speed or definitely paying attention to, to how this might load, like make the page load slower, that can affect your rankings over time. And that's important, right? But it's not something that is immediately apparent to you. There's, unless you know what's going on under the hood, you see the the you know you see the drop in rankings, but you don't understand what what's happened, right? And so um, we always sort of recommend like if you can avoid it, don't do it. Um, yeah. And and it's all for naught because like if you're ranking, if your if your URL is pretty versus not pretty, and you're in that first position, you're going to get sixty to eighty percent of the click throughs no matter what. Like no matter what your URL it looks like, yeah. You know. And if anyone wants proof, just go to YouTube and take a look at their URLs. It's yeah. owned by Google and they mm -hmm. use a hash uh, for their URLs. It's not even readable, human readable. So like you don't right. need pretty URLs. Um, you don't need perfect URLs and, and you can get by with just stupid, right. crappy, ugly URLs. Right. And in terms of the best way to do it, to answer Michelle, um, I know that there are plugins that'll do it, but in terms of something like this, that's sort of a permanent thing that you're changing about your site, I would never rely on a plugin to do it because, you know, plugin makers, you don't have control over whether or not they stop supporting themselves or, you know, whatever. And so the best way to do it is, um, at the server level, which with um, an HT access, like you edit your H HT access file to do that redirect. It's something that if you don't know how to do, you should be involving your host and asking for their help, even if it charge they charge a fee. This is something that is important and that you should uh, do right the first time. So uh, even if it costs you a one-time fee or whatever, just, just pay it to make sure that it's done right by someone who has the technical know-how. Yeah, also, just, don't oh, I'm sorry, don't rebrand. 
don't. Please don't. <laughs> don't, yeah, please don't rebrand. Just oh, everyone. Yeah. No one's going to listen to you, but they, they'll do it. Everyone always does. But um, the other thing that she, people should know about is the rel equals canonical tag. And that's uh, that's a little bit. Uh, it's it's a cool little tag that basically you can put on pages um, that are, let's say, duplicate content of another page. And you're telling Google that the original content is over here. Um, it's a really wonderful little tag. It works just like a 301 redirect, but it doesn't change the URL or the behavior of the content. So it's in the header. No one sees it but Google. And it says rel equals quotation mark canonical. Um, and then it has a URL and the link to the actual original page. Um, it's a really, it's a really useful tool in some instances. Uh, and if you want more, I mean, if you want more info, you can email us uh, the questions at theory of content. I can, if, if you have instances where you think that would be more useful than the 301 redirect, it's not going to be necessarily a good idea for branding, but if you're republishing posts, a, a rel canonical is actually a pretty good option for making sure that any new link equity yeah. world page. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to jump in. Sure. To derail on this one. So <laughs> we've got someone asking, you guys are, you're, you're wonderfully verbose. Uh, we are, we've got uh, someone asking about migrating their, their blog to a new platform. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have an article on that. We have a series on that and we're going to have an additional post on that too. So that's coming out. Right. Everyone she's else? talking, she's talking about moving from Wix, which we don't have. Any oh, we don't have, about. no. Not on that one. No, we can we can see if anyone's done it. Thank yeah, you. we can definitely ask in the Facebook group. That's always a great place to crowdsource uh, questions like that. So we yeah. have just a few more minutes. I want you guys to quickly give your power packed action items, and then we're going to talk about where we can find you. So Amber first. Okay. Uh, so I would say when you're planning new content, um, plan more content around a single idea. Um, so if you are writing a, a recipe and this sort of answers a question that came in as well, if you are writing a recipe about blueberry muffins, plan more content around blueberry muffins because it will help you support your expertise as Google sees it. Um, in the long term and whether you publish those all at once or, you know, over several weeks or whatever, like just make sure they link around to each other. And what I mean by planning extra content. So you could, you could also do raspberry muffins or you could do lemon blueberry muffins. You could do the best quick uh, blueberry muffins, the best, uh, I don't know, uh, toaster oven, toaster oven, blueberry muffins. There's yeah. Muffins always cook in 22 minutes. It's not a thing. The slowest so. muffins of all time. <laughs> Um, you know, you could do a blueberry muffin loaf, like plan content that is related, but isn't necessarily the same keyword, um, but is all supportive of each other. And so that you can continue to, to link back to the blueberry muffins post that you were trying to raise up. <laughs> Eric is in here, guys. Everyone. Oh, Eric. <laughs> you were wondering if he was uh, watching. He is. He will never not hate. 301 redirects and they're slow. So there you have it. Josh, can you jump in with your power pack <laughs> advice, please? Uh, sure. Uh, don't care about SEO. Uh, so <laughs> 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 I, I mean, I, that's the honestly, thing is we don't care. We care about you making content. We yeah, don't care about you like making sure your picture names are right. This is dumb. Like I, it wastes your time. I think I think the best advice that I can give is is just write more. Um, mm -hmm. Amber's Amber's absolutely correct about writing uh, about a single subject matter for quite a bit, but just just write more. Write what you love, and uh, and come up with come up with content that is going to make you continually want to blog. Don't don't get don't don't turn this into a thing you hate. And if you're making content that you love to make, you're going to continue making really good content and you're not going to like yeah. lament the practice of having to write six, seven, 800, maybe a thousand word posts. So write content that you love and, uh, and become really competent at the content that you're writing. If you do desserts, um, then just, you know, do <laughs> get Bake really your buns off. right get get really good at get really good at dessert stuff and like know everything you can possibly know about the nitty-gritty of it and then as you learn 
inform everyone else about what you've learned because that's frankly what makes mm -hmm. the best content the things that you're learning about someone else has taken the same journey um yeah so yeah one of make... my one of my favorite posts from my baking addiction is she the first instant pot cheesecake she wrote she talked about the fact that she didn't realize she had to change the ring so she ended up with pulled pork oreo cheesecake Oh, because the ring, <laughs> the ring takes like gives whatever's in the pot. It can give the flavor, and so she ended up with cold pork cheesecake. Basically, she's like, "Nope, it was beautiful cheesecake, like perfect texture and everything." But she's like, "You would go to take a bite, and you would just get pork, pork essence, yeah." And so that's why Instant Pot sells different rings. And that post to me is like the epitome of great content because, you know, you're admitting, Hey, here's a thing I learned by the way. And she talks about it in her latest one that she just wrote. Um, yes, Steffi, you do. Um, she talks about it in her latest, her latest one that, that she went ahead and she got a new just right. desserts ring. And it's so funny to me. And I think it's great, great content when you write that. And I think people relate to it and they react to it more and, and you get more engagement, which just makes everybody happy. And, and people can sense your passion. Like that's why everyone mm -hmm. reads everything I write about beanie babies. So, okay. I think that's it for now. <laughs> and um, gooseberry pate. <laughs> just all the articles about gooseberry pate. So guys, when is theory of content coming back with live episodes and when can we find you? Where? Uh, we just released... We our most recent live one. Oh, like live. You mean like where we're on stage? When you're no, well, that's happening at Haven, right? Haven. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's that's in Charleston. Mm -hmm. uh, so they will be in Charleston with us at Haven. They're doing two live theory of contents there. So if you have the opportunity to be there, do that. Where can they find you for uh, your podcasts on the regs? Sure. So you sh if you have iTunes or any uh, standard uh, Stitcher you know, and that Stitcher. Kind of stuff. You can search theory of content. We should show right up for you. Um, theory of content.com also, although it's, it looks down for me. So I'm gonna have to go check that out, but theory of content.com. Uh, if you have any questions or you want to like participate in theory of content uh, with questions, you know, if you want us to answer your heart's most burning desires, uh, questions at theory of content.com, we will take a look at those and we'll get those out. Um, we try to, we try to do one about once a week. We've been, sometimes a little we, bit yeah, lackadaisical conference, conference season's been rough on us so. it's amber's fault it is. i i <laughs> i personally hope that your heart's deepest desire is not centered around seo um but if it is they can help you if it's not if it's just a question you're curious about definitely get in touch with them uh oh ursula just said that your site is down at theory of content yeah that's it he'll fix it yeah. he'll fix he'll it, fix we'll, it. Fi we'll get it we'll fixed fix it. and I'm we will i i think at this point it's been determined that we're going to need mm -hmm. to have you guys back this summer on another mm -hmm. on another so we'll look for another date yeah. and guys so next hey. week, oh amber wants to talk i i just wanted if i wondered if we wanted josh's help to announce uh, something about our conference. Yeah, I was actually getting ready to uh, segue into okay. that. So we, sure. so don't. Oh yeah, I got, I, I got I it. Gotcha. Speed dating is happening at the Media Vine conference coming up. <laughs> Eric, Eric, no. and the developers are building a dating app for Media Vine conferences. You heard it here. For, that's not happening. Uh, what not we were, what we are going to say is that next week we are going to have. Uh, our live conference announcements. And you heard me say announcements because there will be two Mediavine conferences next year. What? Whoa. What? Two. what the heck? So we're going to post some information about that. We are going to have people live and with sponsors, I hope. Yes, there will be sponsors there. Yes. That is a given. Uh, but we will have sponsors. We'll have all the things. We'll have information about those next week live announcements. Um, in the conference locations, mm -hmm. it's a remote. This is exciting stuff happening. One in Europe, says Ursula. <laughs> we're thanks working are, on it. Thanks, Ursula. We're working <laughs> on those things. So thank you guys so much for coming. We will see you next week. Thank you to Josh and Amber for being amazing. Thanks to Josh for sticking in there and coming, coming through. <laughs> No Thanks matter what happens. Patience. I, I apologize. Now that we've done this once, I guarantee that it will never be a problem again. But that is uh, a but the dangerous first guarantee words. to me, homeboy. Garan Don't do it. Guarantee. Gar he <laughs> guaranteed. So we will hold him to that. All right, you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for attending Summer of Live. We will see you next week. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs>